Savior, you can move the mountains. You are mighty to save. You know, sometimes we, in life, we, f- we realize that it's only when we find ourselves facing the mountain that we realize how mighty to save God is. We face that mountain, but praise the Lord. He is the God of the mountains. <laughs> Hallelujah. This morning, I'd invite you to turn with me in your Bibles as we finish our three-part message on the spiritual gifts to the book of 1 Peter, towards the back end of the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 4. <clears throat> we're going to kind of be straddling a little bit. This will be a primary text, but we're going to go back and forth a bit between 1 Corinthians 12 also today, as you'll see. This is the second of the two-part message I began last week. It's entitled, Outfitted for Service. Outfitted for service. So I'm going to read 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 9, 10, and 11 to begin with. <clears throat> Showing hospitality to one another without, show hospitality without, to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks, as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Did you notice there in those words, it speaks about being a good steward of the grace of God to the glory of God. And that's going to be in the foremost uh, uh, center of our thoughts this morning. Because as we begin unpacking these last of the six gifts that we're going to look at today, you know, it's, we, not, we need not gloss over, we should not gloss over what Peter is saying here. And that is that the spiritual gifts are given to us to serve the Lord. They are not for our glory, they are for His glory alone. That's the purpose of the gifts, for the glory of God, that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. And that is our preeminent purpose, even beyond the use of the spiritual gifts, the manifestation of the gifts. It's for the purpose of the, of the life of the believer, the church of Christ, to do so for the glory of God. And the Reformers use the, the phrase solo deo gloria, for the glory of God alone, the Reformation during the Reformation, those, those words were vital to the understanding of the work of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, first of all, in verse 4, Paul makes this remark to the church in Corinth. 1 Corinthians 1, 4. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that charis, literally the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and in all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ. You know, the believers there, for instance, those such as the ones that were in Corinth, thought of themselves as being spiritual people, spiritually minded people. And the way that they determined their spirituality was focused on the manifestation of the spiritual gifts, and particularly certain gifts that they thought were the key evidence of the Spirit's ministry through them. But spiritual gifts are not the key evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit in us, believe it or not. They are not the key evidence. Indeed, Alistair Begg, Pastor Alistair Begg, makes this remark when he writes, In 1 Corinthians, Paul makes it clear that the real issue of spirituality has not to do with whatever phenomenal element there may be to the life of the believer, 
but rather has to do with the ethical impact of our lives. So external expressions of spirituality do not prove that I am pleasing to God, nor do they guarantee my salvation. The gifts, he says, are not self-authenticating evidences of our spiritual life. Listen to the words of Jesus at the tail, towards the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount, verse, Matthew 7, and verse 21, following. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Jesus there in those words sets the record straight about the purported dramatic evidences of spirituality. In fact, Alistair Begg goes on to conclude the earlier statement I read when he says this, spiritual gifts are, of, are not of value on account of their dramatic impact. They are of divine importance when seen in the framework which displays them as acts of serving and honoring God. The spiritual gifts are not human abilities to do things. In other words, just one's natural giftedness. Spiritual gifts are not a supernatural novelty. Spiritual gifts should be seen in terms of Christ, who is the head of the body, presently working from heaven amongst his people on earth. End quote. You remember in 1 Corinthians 12, you want to turn there now just for a few verses of, to remember and kind of set the, the backdrop today. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 and following, we read this, Paul writing, he says, To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So as we concentrate our study this morning now on six the gifts, the six gifts that we're going to finalize our study with, the 21 total gifts, now today the last of the six, we we're going to again be reminded how God is out, has outfitted you and I as his followers in the church for service so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, which is what Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 1, first chapter 4 rather, verse 11. And so let me just reiterate one last time the definition we've chosen for a spiritual gift. The spiritual gift is a special divine empowerment bestowed on each believer by the Holy Spirit to accomplish a given ministry God's way according to his grace and discernment to be used within the context of the body of Christ. Can't reiterate the importance again of how significant it is for each of us to be exercising the gift, your gift. If you've been born again with, and fill, you've been given a gift by the Holy Spirit to be used in the service of the Lord as good stewards of the varied grace of God, as Peter says. So the first gift that we're going to look at among the six today is the gift of hospitality, which Peter notes there in 1 Peter 4, 9. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Hospitality. Well, to that we, we would define the gift this way. Hospitality. The gift of hospitality is, could be defined as to warmly welcome people, even strangers, into one's home or church as a means of serving those in need of food or lodging. And those with this serving gift enjoy using it to deepen and strengthen the fellowship of the body by welcoming people into their homes. You may note here in Peter's couple of verses that we're looking at this morning that basically the gifts are we could bracket into two primary categories 
gifts of, that are speaking, speaking gifts, if you will, and serving gifts. Speaking gifts and serving gifts. Hospitality, the gift of hospitality would be a serving gift. And those, you know, of course, in First, P- First Timothy chapter three, Paul says that those who have been called to be elders should have this gift. It should be characterized, if you will, by the gift of of hospitality, because the hospitality gift, as we know, is such a, a blessing to the body of Christ. Those that have the hospitality gift, and I know some of you have that gift, and then that gift is a, is somehow. It becomes like the glue, if you will, in the church. Like people come to your house and enjoy that fellowship, and it just engenders a deepening of the of the fellowship of the body of Christ in the setting of the home. But it can ask, happen and be expressed in, in many different ways. And I, I think of the, the woman Lydia, whose story is recorded for us in the book of Acts, chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, where... Paul and Silas and end up being they're in a in in uh, they're moving in the direction of Philippi, and they come into the district of Philippi in Acts chapter sixteen verse fourteen and fifteen. After Paul had shared the gospel, it says there that the Lord opened Lydia's heart to pay attention what was said by Paul. Let me find my place again here. By yeah, she opened he, Paul. Her heart was opened by the Lord to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Verse fifteen. And after she was baptized, and her household was well as well, rather she urged us, saying, "If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay." And she prevailed upon us. And I think that that's an, an illustration of this very gift. This woman was a person of means, although that's not a necessarily a rule of thumb so to speak in terms of the person has this gift but her heart was to invite them paul and those who were with him to come to their house and be there and and that's what they did and they they were blessed by that and that is an expression of the gift of hospitality as we see it we have a hospitality ministry team phil and liz have with along with rich and d have taken on that responsibility to kind of give leadership to us as we find different ways to to express hospitality and join together in meals that are fellowship oriented and other kinds of things but that hospitality gift is really expressed most of all i feel when it comes to your particular home or my our particular home we enjoy having people too over in those evenings being around the table to share a meal or just fellowshipping in our home provide us opportunities that often don't present themselves in the context of a Sunday morning's gathering like we are in today here so the gifts of hospitality it's a place where people can strengthen the fellowship of the church together by simply being in each, being one with one another praying for each other learning about what's going on in one another's lives and encouraging one another as we follow the Lord the second gift that I want to look at today is actually, if we go back to 1 Corinthians 12, in verse 9, it's the gift of faith. The gift of faith. <clears throat> and it's mentioned there in verse 9, to another faith by the same Spirit. We find that gift actually alluded to, if not directly referred to, in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, verse 2. And Paul says this, If I have prophetic powers... And I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have faith, all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I'm, not no, I'm nothing. And so he's basically saying that, of course, the catalyst of agape love is the foremost importance here, as he even draws it close to chapter 13, verse 13. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. In Jesus Christ, the gift of the Holy Spirit it captures our hearts with a love that we don't have without him. You know, the world may express love and try to love people in different ways, shapes, and forms, but the love of the world is not the love of God. In Christ, we have a love that comes from the Holy Spirit dwelling us and abiding within us, and that is the love that Paul is speaking of there. And he says here, even if I have great faith, that could speak to the mountains. Jesus, remember, Jesus said, if you, know, if you have just the faith of the size of a mustard seed and you say to that mountain, be moved and be thrown into the sea, it will be done so. And Paul comes back on that statement by basically saying that it, you could have that kind of a faith, which is dramatic and, and awesome in one sense, but if you're not at doing so and acting in a manner that is commensurate with the love of Jesus Christ and that underpinning that, 
then it's meaningless. It has no value because that that expression in itself is devoid of or divorced from the Holy Spirit who first and foremost, the, the fruit of the Spirit is love first, joy, peace, patience, and those gifts in turn, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the, the presence the, the, of the Holy Spirit manifest in our lives. And so we would define uh, th- this gift in this way. The gift, of fa- the gift of faith, the spiritual gift, is not saving faith. So we're not speaking about saving faith. We're talking about people that have been saved. And so this is a special gift. And it means to be firmly persuaded of God's power and promises to accomplish his will and purpose and display such a confidence in him and in his word that circumstances and obstacles do not shake that conviction. It is to have an extraordinary trust in God to meet specific needs, even in the face of great obstacles. And this isn't akin to what you might know of uh, the, the word of faith where there's a declaration. Uh, I, I declare that this is so, even though it's not physically or in any other way actually so, if you will. It's not that kind of a, uh, a professed declaration or a pronouncement that essentially summons God to do something because you've declared it to be that way. That's, that's not what we're talking about here. What we're speaking about is a, is a faith that, it, that stands solely on the tr- and trusting the Lord to overcome and address obstacles in your life that without God's intervention cannot and will not occur. If you, how many of you have ever heard of the man George Mueller, who lived back in the 19th century? George Mueller lived from 1805 to 1898 in Bristol, England. Here's a little excerpt from his biography. Mueller and his wife opened the first orphanage in Bristol in 1836 in their rented home to accommodate 30 girls. The ministry grew to the point where they needed to build an orphanage elsewhere in Bristol. And by 1870, 1,722 children were being accommodated in five different orphanages that they, that they operated. Throughout all of this time, Mueller never made requests for financial support, nor did he ever go into debt. In fact, many times he received unsolicited food donations only hours before they were needed to feed the children, further strengthening his faith in God. He was in constant prayer that God would touch the heart of donors to make provisions for the orphans. And on one well-documented occasion, thanks was given for breakfast when all the children were sitting at the table, even though there was nothing to eat in the house. As they finished praying, the baker knocked on the door with enough fresh bread to feed everyone, and the milkman came and gave them plenty of fresh milk because his cart had broken down in front of the orphanage that very morning. And Mueller later in his memoir wrote this. He said, The Lord not only gives as much as is absolutely necessary for his work, but he gives abundantly. This blessing filled me with inexpressible delight. He had given me the full answer of my thousands of prayers during the past 1,195 days. In his lifetime, by the way, I skipped over the fact that he and his wife cared for 10,024 orphans. And along with this, they established 117 schools that offered Christian education to 120,000 children. That's the Lord. (laughs) That is what God does. And it all was predicated really on George Mueller and his wife's faith in God. They trust the Lord time and time and time again, even though what appeared to be in the physical realm an impossibility. And they just prayed and gave, gave God thanks and glory and waited. How many of you believe that that expression of their faith encouraged and excited the faith of others. You better believe that it did. That, can you imagine if you were a child in that orphanage seeing that manifestation of God's provision, even just that one time, and they were all gathered around the table, and there's nothing to eat, and they're praying, and thank, thank you, Lord, for my food. Thank you, Father, for what you've done. There's nothing. As soon as they finish, in comes the baker, followed by the milkman, and uh, there you are. 
you know, time and time again. The, the proceeds, that I can't remember, the, I think it was like 100,000 pounds a year were donated to this ministry. Crazy, because that's what God was doing as he was working. And George Mueller says, I'm just trusting the Lord for what we need. He never solicited those funds. People got swept up in what God was doing, and the Lord provided through their generosity, the gift of faith. You know, again, it's such an awesome thing to to be around people that have that kind of a trust and faith and confidence in God. Because as with the other gifts, when that gift, the gift of faith, is being expressed in the proper way, it encourages the body of Christ. It encourages people. It not only builds up the church, but it encourages and edifies the believers as well. Manifestation of the, of the Spirit's work through the gift of faith. The next gift that we're going to look at this morning, the spiritual gift, is the spiritual gift of discernment or the gift of distinguishing spirits. And again, here in 1 Corinthians 12, 10, first of all, 12, 10, it's listed right there. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. And I would define this gift in this way. To clearly distinguish truth from error by judging whether the behavior or teaching is from God, Satan, human error, or human power. This gift was meant to be protective. It served to verify the true message from God. Now let's look at a few passages where we can see this spoken about at the very least. It's first, first of all, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 in verse 20, very, towards the very end of this letter, 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 and 21, Paul writes, Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. And then he says, abstain from every form of evil. Test everything. That's, that's the idea of, of discerning, discerning, testing, discerning, ju- you know, judging its truth, if you will, the quality of it. Turn over with me now to the to the letter of First John, First John for a couple of little texts in here. First John chapter two. First of all, First John two, and verse twenty. John is speaking about the Antichrist and, and the presence of that his activity in and through people that are associated, if you will, with the church, but not actually believers. First John 2.20, but you, he says, have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because to lie, no lie, rather, is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. So there we find one of the, we could say, litmus tests, if you will, of truth. The denial of Jesus physically being born, you know, incarnate. He is the Christ of God. And John goes on in verse 26 there to say, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive, speaking of the Holy Spirit, received from him abides in you and you need no anyone should teach you but as his anointing the holy spirit's anointing teaches you about everything and and is true and is no lie just as it has taught you abide in him in christ the spirit of christ now move over to first john chapter four first john chapter four here we find yet another uh way to to speak about this matter of discer- discernment or distinguishing the spirits first john 4 1 beloved i do not believe every spirit but test the spirits to see whether they are from god for many false prophets have gone out into the world by this you know the spirit of god every spirit that confesses that jesus christ has come in the flesh is from god And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. 
Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Now, by way of more like a practical illustration of this gift, you could turn back to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 and verse 20. Acts chapter 8, verse 20. Philip has gone after the dispersion. Uh, the martyrdom of Stephen precipitated that, of course, and he goes to, he ends up in, in Samaria where he's preaching the gospel. In Acts chapter 8, verse 20, <clears throat> Peter, the apostle, has come down, and he is addressing this man named Simon. Simon. In verse 20, he says, but he's, Peter says to Simon, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. The intent of your heart. You know, have you ever found yourself confronted with something and people would respond this way? Well, you don't really know their heart. You don't really know your heart. Now, that is true. However, in this case, it appears as though Peter could see or know the intent of his heart. Why was that? It was because of the gift of discernment God had given to him. That's why. We see that same thing really illustrated actually earlier in Acts in Acts chapter 5, where Peter is addressing and rebuking Ananias and Sapphira. Remember this story? Acts 5. He says there, this man, they sold this piece of property, and they came, and they held back some of the prof proceeds from the sale of that. But they put it at the feet of the apostles, as had other people, such as Barnabas. And they claimed that that, that was the whole pro proceeds of all of the sale, the full sum of that. And so what does Peter say? Peter said to Ananias, verse 3, 5, Acts 5, 3, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourselves part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain in your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. Can we know the heart? What has Jesus said about that which comes out of the mouth is the overflow of the heart? All kinds of manner of evil things and vile things and so forth and so on. Out of the heart come all of those things, the heart of man. When the heart of man is changed, and the heart manifests a difference. So Peter addresses him first, and the Lord strikes him down. Sometime later, his wife comes in, and he says, is this what happened? And she agrees with that, the lie. And he says, well, the same people that came, that Bert took your husband's body out and buried him, we're going to bury you too. She drops, and she's killed. And that's what struck the people, because the God's spirit was working in power, and it was indisputable. Great fear, it says there in verse 11, came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. The manifestation of the gift of distinguishing miracles. Believers who have this gift, the distinguishing of spiritual things, spirit, the spirits rather, have a heightened spiritual awareness of situations. They have a heightened spiritual awareness of words that are spoken and even the teaching of false teachers who purport to be speaking the truth but in fact are not speaking the truth. And it's almost like a, it, it is actually not just almost, it is a sort of a, a spirit-given intu intuitive perception of the truth or the error and I know some folks that, that have demonstrated this particular gift and again this is essential for the working of the church because as it was even in the time of Christ and the apostles in the early church and every century since the early church and in up to this day there are there are charlatans there are false teachers there are people who purport to be followers of Jesus not just the, the, the certain religious sects and, and, and cults and so forth, like the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses or someone of that kind that purport to be true followers of the Jesus of the Bible, but are actually not. 
because of what their theology declares them to be. But they would, if you would see them, you would say, well, they're, you know, they, they're, they're true. They're good people. They're, they're just like me. No, they're not, you know. Just learn that. And so get, people have the gift of discernment are able to see through those things and discern it. And that voice, their, their input is so important for me as a leader. It's important for us as a church body. And we need to hearken to that and be discerning ourselves as we're called to be. As I said, Peter really is addressing two primary categories. He's addressing the serving gifts and the speaking gifts. And in one sense, the gift of discern, distinguishing spirit kind of falls in between there. But it speaks the truth. It, it presents, it, it confronts at times, and it speaks up about that. Because as I said, the gift is meant to be protective, to serve, to verify the true message of God. Now here, back in First Peter chapter 4, in verse 11, we read this. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God there's one who speaks oracles of God in the original tank tense of the Greek the text the word oracles of God is the word logos or logon literally the tense of the Greek verb and it literally would be rendered the utterances of God the words of God logon ho Theon in Greek, if you want to know the, tech, the actual technical words. And so whoever speaks is one who's speaking the oracles of God. And we know in Hebrews chapter 1, the writer begins this way. Hebrews 1, verse 1, he begins this way. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed the heir of all things and through whom also he created the world. God has spoken to us by his son, Jesus Christ. In Peter's second letter, second Peter chapter one and verse 21, Peter makes this remark. Second Peter 1 21 for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were born along by, literally carried along by, Pharaoh, by the Holy Spirit. The Greek word Pharaoh, carried along by, born along by the Holy Spirit. And so Peter, again, says whoever speaks should be, is speaking as one who speaks the oracles of God. So now these last three that we're going to consider, these last three spiritual gifts are the gifts of evangelism, words of knowledge, and words of wisdom. Those last three in turn. So first of all, the gift of evangelism which we could define this way to be a messenger of the good news of the gospel leading people to put their faith in Christ this person has an extraordinary burden for the unsaved and an ability to present the gospel clearly Mike our brother has that gift I've seen it in action in his life in your life Mike and I know you have that burden. You said it, spoke of it this morning when sharing about Michaela and your hope that tomorrow God will give you that chance. That's a burden that the person with the gift of evangelism has. We know the man Billy Graham, the renowned evangelist of the last century, had this gift. He spoke to millions of people all over the earth. And God used the man in a remarkable way to call people to saving faith in Christ. There's another person who's spoken of in Acts chapter 8. We want to go back there again. Acts chapter 8 is the man Philip, who was one of the deacons, one of the original deacons, along with Stephen and some of the other men, five other men. Philip finds himself, after the scattering, the dispersion of the church from Jerusalem, and he went throughout, he says in verse 4 there of Acts Acts 8, now those who were scattered went about preaching the word, and Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. He proclaimed to them the Christ. Verse 6, and the crowds with one accord pay attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits were crying out with a loud voice, and they came out of many of the, the many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed, so that there was much joy in the city. In fact, down just a little further in this chapter, we find now Philip 
being told by the angel of the Lord to go down to the south road that goes out from Jerusalem to, the, to Gaza, and he meets there a man riding in a chariot who we know as the Ethiopian eunuch. That's this passage here, the latter portion of the, of the chapter. And so he's going there, and, and it says later in, in Acts chapter 8, it says there in verse 29, And the Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join the chariot. And so he runs up, and he, he hears the man reading from the text of Isaiah, pro, the prophet. And he says to him, Do you understand what you're reading? He said, Well, how can I unless somebody tells me what it means? So he climbs up into the chariot, right? And so he, re, he, he, he hears him. The passage that he's reading is from Isaiah 53. Right? And so the eunuch says to Philip in verse 34, about whom, I ask, does the prophet say this? Does he's talking about himself or about someone else? Listen, in verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with the scripture, he said, told him the good news about Jesus. How many of you know how this story ends? How does that end? What happens next? By the Holy Spirit. Yeah. The Ethiopian gets saved. He, come, he turns to Christ because P- P- Philip, the man used of the Holy Spirit to present the gospel to him, is done so in a convincing way that the Lord turns the heart of this Ethiopian man. And they said, hey, there's some water. What prevents me from being baptized? So out of the chariot, they climb down into the water. He's baptized, and the Holy Spirit takes him away elsewhere. That was the Holy Spirit. And he was using the man Philip to, to do those things. Even Paul, of course, Paul the Apostle, prayed in, in Ephesians chapter 6, speaking at the, at the very tail end of the gifts of the, of the armor of God, rather, that he mentions there in, in Ephesians 6. He says, and pray for me also that words may be given to me to open my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. You know, believers who have the gift of evangelism are constantly, it seems, on the lookout for opportunities, divine appointments, opportunities to share the gospel, to speak about Jesus Christ and to share the gospel, the good news of salvation with them. Why? Because they have a, an abiding burden, a, a, a penetrating flame, a burden on their heart to see those persons that don't know Christ hear the gospel and turn by saving faith to Christ and be saved. That's the burden on their heart. That's the thing that drives them when they get up in the morning. They, they're looking for those opportunities and persons that have the gift of evangelism or noon because of that driving, compelling burden that's on their spirit. And again, the gift of evangelism is, is given to those that, that serve in that way. And it is an encouragement to the body of Christ to come alongside of others who don't know the, the gospel and have never heard of Christ, perhaps, and to encourage us to, to, to do the same. And I know Mike has encouraged me to do that myself, and I am a pastor, to just be aware of people and to be praying for God to give us those opportunities, and I very much appreciate that. The next gift, the fifth of the ones we're going to look at today, is called is the gift of knowledge or words of knowledge, and this is actually noted in 1 Corinthians. Again, we're back and forth a little bit here, but 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8, 1 Corinthians 12, 8, it's mentioned here, to another the utterance of wisdom to another, the utterance of knowledge by the Holy Spirit. So we're going to look at knowledge first. Again, utterance of the words of, you know, words of knowledge, if you will, just as Peter said in First Peter 4, oracles of God, the same lingo, the same words, if you will, in the Greek text. And so words of knowledge, we could define this way, to seek to learn as much as possible about the Bible through the gathering of much information and analyzing that information and then being able to communicate that knowledge of God's Word effectively to others for their edification. This gift, I believe, is, is often uh, uh, you know, the other side of the coin of the gift of teaching, the spiritual gift of teaching. The teacher has, gift, has this ability to, to extrapolate knowledge, to learn, to assimilate that knowledge, and to be able to rightly and adequately 
convey that knowledge and pass that knowledge on. This gift of knowledge or the utterance of knowledge, as it's said there, is not for one's own self-benefit or edification. It's not so so you can get a, a big old head full of a, an encyclopedic knowledge about the Bible or about Jesus and so forth and so on. It's not that. It's meant to, you're simply the, pa- the pipeline through which Jesus speaks and uses you to give you the capacity to be able to understand and teach others of the Word of God. And believers who have this gift have a special God-given ability, I believe, to not only grasp the truth of the Word of God, but they also have with that a depth of insight into the Word of God that is driven by the Holy Spirit. It is not an academic knowledge. You could, you could have an IQ of 200 and, and maybe be able to memorize the whole book, the Bible cover to cover and not have this gift necessarily. The gift of knowledge is something that the Holy Spirit takes and he uses it for the glory of Christ. It's not just an academic knowledge. It is something that drives the truth of the message of the Bible into the hearts of the people who receive that teaching and are, and are guided thereby. And the final one that we want to address this morning is, again, words of wisdom or the word of, word of wisdom, the message of wisdom, again, associated here with this very gift. And I would define it this way. To present and apply knowledge to life in such a way as to make spiritual truths quite relevant and practical in proper decision-making in daily life situations. A word of wisdom must always come from God's revealed word, the Bible, and be tested and held by the Bible accordingly. It's not just an erroneous thought that suddenly drops into your mind. It's always something that is driven by the Holy Spirit, the author of the text of Scripture. Indeed, James speaks about the matter of wisdom from above and that which is not the wisdom from above. And he specifically speaks about wisdom that is from above that produces a righteous life, a godly life. Now, two illustrations that, I, that come to mind would first of all be Peter and John. And we read of their story in Acts chapter 4. Just, I'll read these verses. You're welcome to join me too. But it's just Acts 4.13 after they testified about Jesus' name and the, there's no name given under heaven and has been given among men by which we must be saved, that's Acts 4, 12. Verse 13, it says, Now when they, the, San, the Sanhedrin, the high council of the Jews, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and they perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished and they recognized not that they had gone to some other school to learn a bunch of stuff, No, they recognized that these men had been with Jesus. I mean, they were Galileans. They didn't have an education like the men that were confronting them who were looked to as being the the know-it-alls, the religious leaders. These are the people, you know. No, they saw within them something that was God-given. It came from heaven. These men spoke boldly of who Christ is, and that knowledge, that capacity to do that, that wisdom was of God. Another illustration of it is the man Stephen. One verse really comes out of Acts chapter 6. In Acts chapter 6, verse 10, it says of Stephen that he had been doing, you know, wonders, you know, miracles and signs. And they, they call him in. They dispute with him, you know, over this, over what he's saying and doing. In Acts 6, verse 10, it says, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. They could not withstand the spirit and the wisdom of that. Why? Because it was the Holy Spirit. They they couldn't refute it. And it wasn't just about mincing words. It was was just the recognition that God was using this man, Stephen. And we know that the outcome of that onslaught of, of his attack there through that event led to his being martyred. And Saul of Tarsus, the man who we now know as the Apostle Paul, was there that day. God used that in a way to eventually turn Paul's heart through the Damascus Road experience that he had. And so as we come to a close this morning and really this little mini-series on the spiritual gifts, I'd just like to leave this with you to think about. And that is that the future effectiveness and significance and development and growth 
and the impact of the people of God here at Living Word Community Church is directly linked to each member doing our part to contribute to the work of the ministry. How? By developing your spiritual gifts, by deploying those gifts, and using them, as Peter writes, for the glory of God, being a good steward of the very grace of God to serve one another. And using your gifts is not a once a, day, once a week event between 10 and noon on a Sunday morning. Using your spiritual gifts is something that we do seven days a week. And it may, may, may become more, uh, somewhat more manifestly obvious in the body of Christ as we serve and work together, rejoice together. And serve in, in various ways together as the church body. But your gifts, God wants to use you as a force in this world, my friends. He wants to use us as a, as a people wherever we are. In a way, we're all missionaries in our own right elsewhere, wherever we go, wherever we live. We don't have to be called to go to the mission field. We're a missionary in our own right, serving the Lord, exercising that gift, being sensitive to heed and attend to and keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. And I encourage you to do that because today as a church body this on the cusp of this brand new year, brand new year, we're now just beginning together. We need each other. We need to serve together arm in arm. We need to give. We need to serve. We need to be committed to that and the prioritization of that. And I do truly believe that as we do so, my friends, the Lord is going to grow this church body and magnify his glory in this place and through the ministry of this congregation in time to come we have to trust the lord together and walk together seeing each other not as people rowing in opposite direction down the same stream but sitting in one vessel with a hand on the oar all pulling together going forward amen amen let's pray together father we just